of all, I want to thank Zed for inviting me to talk about female empowerment. I also want to thank uh, Saja, who sang a song in the beginning, Laid Dam Ayamma. And as for Imkid Bagulha Bilahjal Hijaziya, my talk is about Laid Dam Ayamma Liyom. How many people watched the royal wedding yesterday? I swore I wouldn't watch it, and then I see one Facebook status saying that the dress is gorgeous. I go and I turn it on. Um, Kate Middleton, she's a young modern bride for those who may not have been watching CNN, CBS, Fox, Al Arabiya, Jazeera News for the past week, um, is marrying her prince, which is in a nutshell the fairy tale for many young women. Alhamdulillah, not my daughters, but many young women. I'm happy for the couple. I just want to say this. They seem to be normal-ish, you know, as normal as a duchess and a, Dutch, uh, a duke can be. They seem to be happy. They seem to be in love after 10 years, which is a major accomplishment. Uh, so we have to give them that. Yes, it's a big um, round of applause. What I'm not happy about is how Kate Middleton and women like Michelle Obama, myself, and other prominent women around the world are usually confined to stereotypes. Kate Middleton and Michelle Obama are confined to the good wife stereotype. Women like Hillary Clinton, when she was running for president, okay, um, when she was running for president, um, was aggressively attacked by men and women for her professional demeanor. And only the statistics started to um, go up for her, the polls started to go up for her when she cried. This is why for me, it's important to examine both female leadership roles and also this concept of motherhood as ways to achieve female empowerment for a better world. Um, you can tell from the introduction, I work. I'm on TV. Everybody knows that I'm on TV. And I wear many hats other than that. At a recent educational event, and I'm sure many of you have done this in schools or other um, company team leadership um, uh, initiatives and, you know, those kind of uh, workshops, they ask you to use words or to have words that others describe you. How do people see you? And also, to use a word that describes yourself. This is a way to actually get at the perception versus reality. And before I tell you the word that I chose at that educational event, let me just explain a little bit about myself for those who don't know me, and maybe even a little bit more about myself for those who do know me and things they didn't know. Um, I'm a Saudi woman. Um, I lived in the States for most of my life. I'm almost 38. I started working at the age of 22 with only two maternity leaves, and this is gonna be very important for later on. I'm a fashion entrepreneur. I'm wearing my 2001 collection right now. Thank you. I sit on several boards, and I try to join as many formal networking organizations as I possibly can, such as the Young President's Organization, YPO. Any YPOers here today? Hi. <laughs> Um, I'm an information junkie, and I think every single person who attends TEDx has to be an information junkie. I call myself, I like to read from the inquirer to the economist, and everything in between. I'm a single mother of two daughters. My eldest is graduating from high school this year. I'm passionate about effective education initiatives. I'm passionate about female empowerment, and I have loved every single job that I ever took in my life. So now you know a little bit about me. Back to the question is, what are the traits that people see me? I happen to have a Facebook fan page. So anybody here from the members of my fan page? Hi, thank you for coming and supporting me. I really appreciate it. So it was easy for me to go and actually doing the, the, the event very quickly look at some of the words that people have used to describe me. And I'm going to say the positive ones. Determined, committed, doer, wonder woman, 
two words, but I love it. Um, I also got opinionated, stubborn, perfectionist, but not in a good way. These were rants that went on for paragraphs about my work and about myself. The word that I would choose to describe myself is tired. I'm tired not just because I'm a single working mother. As any mother or working woman can tell you, our schedules are busy. Not because my energy levels go down because of the amount of pressure that I face. I'm tired because, like many people here, like many women here, I'm tired of struggling to get basic human rights sometimes, legal rights. I'm tired of fighting to sit at the table. I'm tired of not being heard. I'm tired of being marginalized over and over again. There's a running joke that uh, in a board meeting, the CEO would hear a woman say her opinion. And once she's finished, she says, OK, well, Ken, and I'll use an Arabic word, but they said, John, Ahmed can say it so we can hear it now. Other people take the credit for your work. I'm tired that I cannot be accepted for who I am that my personality has to fit a stereotype. Good wife, crying woman, passionate woman, caregiver. I'm tired of seeing women unable to work, learn, or be economically independent just because of their gender. I'm tired of having women paid five times less in my part of the world than their male counterparts. Yeah, a lot of women are like, what? <laughs> that's how much? Yeah, that's how much sometimes, most of the times. I'm tired of having women lose power, income, and self-esteem because society sees their motherhood responsibilities only in dollar signs that affect the company's bottom line. I'm tired of a world system that's designed to keep most women, including me, out of it to keep women dissatisfied, to keep women unfulfilled, unable to realize their full potential just because of their gender. One out of every three women is abused or raped in the world. Literacy in the Arab world varies from 20% to 80% uh, against male literacy. We have limited access to capital and a lot of opportunities. And if you add in the Arab world the culture and traditions that we all face as well, then somehow the world seems just so unfair. It's just part of the system that we live in. It's all the system. Well, what is the system? What is the system that is not helping me to be able to be myself as I want to be? Any guesses? Patriarchy, anybody? It's patriarchy, and before men groan and moan and say, you know, it's our fault again, yes, it is. Okay, that's first. It is your fault. <laughs> but, but, women also participate in this patriarchal system. Yeah, the men are like, yeah. <laughs> exactly. It's both men and women working in that system to reinforce it generation after generation. So how do I define patriarchy? There are many ways of defining patriarchy. I define it as positions of power. Who are the decision makers? Yes, exactly. Somebody's like, yes, exactly. <laughs> decision makers. Who are the decision makers in the legal framework that we live in? In economics, education, in the house. Who makes the big decisions? Who makes the money decisions? Who signs the checks? Sounds familiar? So this system basically, as Alan Johnson defines it, promotes male privilege by being male-dominated and male-centered. So women like me do squeeze through. I'm not saying women don't get in. Women squeeze through. But it's so tough. It's a, such a struggle. And I'm not saying that all men benefit from the system. It's a hierarchy. Some men are going to be superior to others, just the way it works. But the men are not excluded because of their gender. I'm excluded because of something I cannot control. Another way 
to test patriarchy is that I want each one of you to think about the last week. All the newspaper articles, all the magazines you saw, all the news that has happened, and take away the revolutions because that's you know, a, a temporary thing right now. The pictures that you see of women. Think of a couple of pictures that you've seen in the past week. Were they somebody signing a check or were they cutting a ribbon? Or worse, were they eye candy in the entertainment section in the back of the magazine? My life and every woman who's here today, every woman who lives is shaped by the choices she makes. That's a given. But the choices we make are within a system that does not allow us to make the choices we want to make. The system, patriarchy, has been unfair to women. This is not rocket science. Let me make this a little bit more concrete to show how unfair it is. In the wor how many working women do we have here today? Working women? Okay. So some of the things at work. We know that women are paid less already, right? If you're opinionated, you're really opinionated, then you're labeled as a troublemaker. And nobody wants to hire a troublemaker. You're confined by glass ceiling in Jordan. It's quite high. You guys are one of the better countries that we have in the Arab world. But in many places, it's quite, quite low, almost to the floor. You're excluded from informal networks. Remember I talked about formal networks? These I can join, stuff, but I do join them. Informal networks where the decision makers meet and socialize and make decisions and get to know each other, I'm excluded. If a man is aggressive, he's edgy, he's a leader. If a woman is aggressive, she has PMS. Yeah, I see a lot of women have had that one thrown at them. And if you have kids, or you want to have kids, or you're thinking about having kids, you can kiss your next promotion goodbye the minute you say life-work balance. And let's not even talk about a gross injustice. Men can get away with the same wardrobe and nobody ever notices. That alone, you know, just changing a tie. Now, if you go into dry cleaning expenses, dry cleaning a female cotton work shirt costs more than a male cotton work shirt. So these are some of the little things, you know, our daily lives that wake women upset. Some might even say, angry, not as an angry bird, angry woman. So this is my first point about empowerment. It's important to have role models in the decision-making positions. It's very important to be able to um, know that a woman can do the job. We have to break those mental barriers down. It is no longer acceptable to think that a woman is less than a man in any capacity. And we've done a good job in the Arab world. Jordan is, again, a very good example of this. We have women in ministerial uh, positions. We have women in high-powered positions in many, usually NGOs, not companies. But we do have some of them. The problem is that those role models are just that. They're the exceptions to the rule. There's a very small space for maneuvering for women leaders. Some women push through it. Some women, their families or their names push them to it. And some women are mentored into it, which has happened to me. And we get so happy about these women reaching there. I got so happy to be a UNDP good ambassador a few years ago of, of reaching the position that I got. And I forget that it's a very small space. It's a very small space. Having a few women in powerful positions creates this illusion of equality that is just an illusion. 
The system has to change so that we can actually push more women in to become powerful naturally. For me, the solution for this is to have quotas. Quotas, study after study has shown, they work. Countries like Sweden, Iceland uh, use them, and we can see the changes in society because of those. If we leave government and corporate world alone, surprise, surprise, they're not going to put women in decision-making power, uh, powerful positions. But if we force them, we re regulate them, we punish them, then they actually do. And you see the difference. It has been shown that corporations run better when there's more women on the board, for example. My second point is a little bit more controversial. And it's about the professionalization and uh, monetization of motherhood. Um, Everybody is familiar now with the idea of uh, some women who can't, unfortunately, have children or perhaps don't want to have children or don't want to ruin their figures, um, renting somebody else to do it for them, subcontracting the pregnancy um, in India. That's not what I'm talking about. That does exist, but that's not my point. My point is about I want to bring women's work, bringing children to the world as actually and is actually a sign, dollar signs. I want it to be included in the GDP. I want to be having many tax breaks for women who have children. I want, among other measures, other things that would benefit the whole family so that people value motherhood. Whether a mother is working or not, by the way, that's a very important point. It should be in the system that motherhood is recognized and acknowledged as a major productivity wheel and instrument for progress. Motherhood is the one thing that's very unique to my gender. It's the one thing that every single woman almost, I, you know, there might be a couple of exceptions, pays for every month since she's 12. Yet somehow, the whole world tries to show me that it's not that important. Somebody else can do it. Somebody else can raise my kids. Somebody else can have my kids. They devalue and demean some thinking that's very central to me. To me. And of course, I see how motherhood has been used to express, to oppress, just a minute, I'm, I'm feeling there's a little bit of an echo. Is there? Okay, because I'm hearing myself twice. Okay. So for most people, what we're used to is that motherhood is used to oppress us. It's not actually about being a mother. It's the idea of you being able to be a mother, which is almost every woman here. The minute a woman walks in the door in the corporate world, she gets paid less in most countries in the world just because the future ability of having kids. And if she does have young kids while she's working, then the flexible time in most places does not exist. Or if it does exist, it's called the mommy track, basically a dead-end career. And if you want to prove yourself, then you better put your kid in a nursery or have somebody else, maybe even a semi-illiterate immigrant in many places in the world, and in the Arab world, and particularly the nannies that we hire who don't even have um, elementary school education to take care of our children. These are the women who make it because they're able to live life, working life to the fullest. And if you don't, then you're slowly pushed out. You're not promoted. So most Arab women are punished if they do continue working or if they stop working or if they never even have children to begin with. And let's not forget one very important statistic, that single mothers are the poorest segment of society everywhere in the world. So we need to start compensating mother for their production. I would like mothers, whether they work or not, to start getting value back. This is a system that I want to do. 
I'm talking about special discounts, you know, like the senior citizen discounts. Let's start institutionalizing some mother discounts. Let's get them on airplane tickets, on services that we get, on car loans, on lower interest. And how about big discounts for any training courses that a woman wants to take while she's having children? I want society to stop paying lip service by giving me a Mother's Day card or some flowers and to show me the money. That's what I want. And also, I want to create a system within work where flexible time is the, is the system, not the option. I choose to opt out of flexible time versus it's seen as the mommy track. I would like to provide continuing education and work internships for mothers who choose to leave work for any reason. Basically, to enable mothers to sharpen their skills. And each society has to develop its own system. Some people are not going to like what I say. It's considered weak that I can admit that for the 15 years out of my 75 years of life, I might need some help a full support system that allows me to do both things, fulfill myself and also have children. Just 15 years, one minute, 30 seconds, 15 years out of 45 years to the official, you know, if I work from 20 to 65, it's only 15 years. 15 years that I end up paying for every single year of my life if I'm working. That's just not fair. I do what I do and I think about the things that I think about because I have two daughters who are joining the workforce and who, who inshallah, excuse me, inshallah will be mothers one day. I don't want them to have to do the compromises that I did because I loved working. That's the one thing that's always been constant since I was very young. I've always loved working and I've been punished for it. For the sake of all of our daughters today, the system simply has to change. Thank you.